Bam! Hey everybody, this is your buddy Carl for the Daily Bible Reading. And um, yeah, let's just dive right in. Interesting times. Just stay encouraged in the Word and in prayer and in being uh, faithful and positive. Not just being positive thinking, but step into faith. And part of that is being somebody that worships and prays and spends time in the Word and then letting your faith be an be activated by the way you live intimately with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's the key. Uh, all right, let's dive in. We are in <laughs> March 27th, right? March the 27th. Just double checking. Yes, and it's back on the computer too. So Deuteronomy, yep, chapter 7, chapter 8. Here we go. Deuteronomy 7, so when the Lord your God brings you into the land you are about to enter and occupy, he will clear away many nations ahead of you. The Hittites, the Gergashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. These seven nations are greater and more numerous than you. Now, folks, that's really key to get here. God is going to move out seven nations greater and more numerous than the Israelites, and yet God's going to do it. Amazing. When the Lord your God hands these nations over to you and you conquer them, you must completely destroy them. Make no treaties with them and show them no mercy. You must not intermarry with them. Do not let your daughters and sons marry their sons and daughters, for they will lead your children away from me to worship other gods. Then the anger of the Lord will burn against you, and he will quickly destroy you. This is what you must do. You must break down their pagan altars and shatter their sacred pillars, cut down their Asherah poles, and burn their idols. For you are a holy people who belong to the Lord your God. Of all the people on earth, the Lord your God has chosen you to be his own special treasure. I'll pause here a little bit. Sometimes people read this and think, God is too harsh. And folks, all I can tell you is we just have to step back and realize the times and through centuries and how God dealt with mankind. I've said that before, but just so you know today, to affirm if you're joining me, sometimes you just have to keep reading the word and ponder, put a question mark there. And I've even said, Lord, why? And, you know, there are studies about this and people debate that. And theologians and apologists kind of go back and forth. What? Why did God have to be so severe? And God says there he didn't want anything to lead his people astray. And um, so anyway, we're going to just keep reading on. I'm not going to unpack that sermon today. That's not what the daily reading is for. There are studies on that. And again, it's this position of like, Lord, I trust you with the times and the way you deal with mankind through the ages. We are now living in this time or dispensation under the new covenant in Christ Jesus. It's a whole other season of the earth. Okay, so we're going to move on. Deuteronomy 7, now to verse 7. The Lord did not set his heart on you and choose you because you were more numerous than other nations, for you were the smallest of all nations. Rather, it was simply that the Lord loves you. And he was keeping the oath he had sworn to your ancestors. So that right there is one of the key things to remember. Whatever you may believe about the historical part of Scripture there and why God was being that harsh, the key there is the fact that the Lord loved them. And he loves everybody. And he was keeping the oath he'd sworn to, his, to their ancestors. So it's key to that as well. This is why the Lord rescued you with such a strong hand from your slavery and from the oppressive hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Understand, therefore, that the Lord your God is indeed God. Well, there it is. He is indeed God. He is the faithful God who keeps his covenant for a thousand generations and lavishes his unfailing love on those who love him and obey his commands. But he does not hesitate to punish and destroy those who reject him. 
Therefore, you must obey all these commands, decrees, and regulations I am giving you today. Uh, again, I'm not going to, I'm just going to keep reading, I'm not going to unpack how God chose to do that and why that happened and what it means through time. All right, moving on. If you listen to these regulations and faithfully obey them, the Lord your God will keep his covenant of unfailing love with you as he promised with an oath to your ancestors. He will love you and bless you and he will give you many children. He will give fertility to your land and your animals. When you arrive in the land he swore to give your ancestors, you will have large harvest of grain, new wine and olive oil and great herds of cattle, sheep, and goats. You will be blessed above all the nations of the earth. None of your men or women will be childless, and all your livestock will bear young. And the Lord will protect you from all sickness. He will not let you suffer from the terrible diseases you knew in Egypt, but he will inflict them on all your enemies. Wow. You must destroy all the nations the Lord your God hands over to you. Show them no mercy and do not worship their gods or they will trap you. Perhaps you will think to yourselves, how how can we ever conquer these nations that are so much more powerful than we are? But don't be afraid of them. Just remember that the Lord your what just remember what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh and to all the land of Egypt. Remember the great terrors the Lord your God sent against them. You saw it all with your own eyes. And remember the miraculous signs and wonders and the strong hand and powerful arm with which he brought you out of Egypt. The Lord your God will use this same power against all the people you fear. And then the Lord your God will send terror to drive them to drive out the few survivors still hiding from you. No, do not be afraid of those nations, for the Lord your God is among you, and he is a great and awesome God. The Lord your God will drive those nations out ahead of you little by little. You will not clear them away all at once. Otherwise, the wild animals would multiply too quickly for you. But the Lord your God will hand them over to you. He will throw them into complete confusion until they are destroyed. He will put their kings in your power, and you will erase their names from the face of the earth. No one will be able to stand against you, and you will destroy them all. You must burn their idols in fire, and you must not covet the silver or gold that covers them. You must not take it, or it will become a trap to you, for it is detestable to the Lord your God. Do not bring any detestable objects into your home, for then you will be destroyed just like them. You must utterly detest such things, for they are set apart for destruction. The overall theme here, people, is the idea God wants nothing before him. Anything that's set up as an idol or other gods, that frustrates God. It makes him angry. And this time, God's like, he wouldn't have it. And uh, God doesn't like it now. But in New Covenant times, God's mercy is more available in a way, really. Anyway, can't unpack all that. It, it <laughs> I always find myself, yeah, Lord, I'm just going to keep reading here. going to get in the clear of this. This is heavy stuff. And there are times, too, you can watch people discuss the meaning of this. But uh, I'm going to move on. Today's reading moves on through Deuteronomy 8. A call to remember and obey. Be careful to obey all the commands I'm giving you today. Then you will live and multiply and you will enter and occupy the land the Lord swore to give your ancestors. Remember how the Lord your God led you through the wilderness for these 40 years, humbling you and testing you to prove your character and to find out whether or not you would obey his commands. Yes, he humbled you by letting you go hungry and then feeding you with manna a food previously unknown to you and your ancestors. He did it to teach you that people do not live by bread alone. Remember when Jesus quoted that? Man doesn't live by bread alone. Rather, we live by every word that comes from the mouth of God. How about that? There you go. That's Jesus' response in the desert. Remember? Remember Satan in the deserts tempting him? You can make bread out of these stones. And, and Jesus quotes this that man does not live by bread alone. Rather, we live by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus was a man of the word. 
He was the living word, but he knew the word too. For all these 40 years, your clothes didn't wear out and your feet didn't blister or swell. Think about it. Just as a parent disciples a child, the Lord your God disciplines you for your own good. So obey the commands of the Lord your God by walking in his ways and fearing him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land flowing with streams, flowing streams and pools of water with fountains and springs that gush out in the valleys and hills. It's a land of wheat and barley, of grapevines, fig trees, pomegranates, of olive oil and honey. It is a land where food is plentiful and nothing is lacking. It is a land where iron is as common as stone and copper is abundant in the hills. When you have eaten your fill, be sure to praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Wow. Always be grateful when the Lord is pouring out abundance and when you're filling yourself. That's why we say grace. We say prayers over food and meals or when, you know, we just look at what we're doing in our lives where we show gratitude to the Lord. Verse 11, but that is the time to be careful. Beware that in your plenty, you do not forget the Lord your God and disobey his commands, regulations, and decrees that I'm giving you today. For when you have become full and prosperous and have built fine homes to live in, and when your flocks and herds have become very large and your silver and gold have multiplied along with everything else, be careful. Folks, huge warning, and we all know this. Man, wealth and prospering, it's our nature to forget where it comes from when God is really blessing. Sometimes when it's hard and we're struggling, then we're like crying out to God, God help. But when it's really good, may we stay humble and give glory to God and thanks to God always and ask him how to faithfully manage the great things he gives our hands, okay? That's super important. Verse 14, do not become proud at that time and forget the Lord your God who rescued you from slavery in the land of Egypt. Do not forget that he led you through the great and terrifying wilderness with its poisonous snakes and scorpions where it was so hot and dry. He gave you water from the rock. He fed you with manna in the wilderness, a food unknown to your ancestors. He did this to humble you and to test you for your own good. He did all this so you would never say to yourself... God did all this so they would never say to yourself and us too, I have achieved this wealth with my own strength and energy. Yeah, how many people say, I've done this. I'm a self-made man. Even if you don't know the Lord, you didn't make it, buddy. You don't. God takes care of people. God's business is in the earth. And it's, it's best that we quickly recognize the Lord. So never let your heart go there. Verse 18, remember the Lord your God. So don't say that. Remember that God did it. He is the one who gives you power to be successful in order to fulfill the covenant he confirmed to your ancestors with an oath. But I assure you of this. If you ever forget the Lord your God and follow other gods and worshiping and bowing down to them, you will certainly be destroyed. Just as the Lord has destroyed other nations in your path, you also will be destroyed if you refuse to obey the Lord your God. All right, folks, that's the reading of Old Testament stuff for the day. Ah, oh, so much history to ponder there. Moving on, today's psalm. Psalm, yes, Psalm 69. And we're going to read all of uh, 69 today. No, actually, we're just going to do 1 through 18. According to the reading, March 27th. Here we go. Psalm 69, 1 through 18. Oh yeah, King David again. Hmm. The theme is a cry of distress in a sea of trouble. We may have to suffer severely for our devotion to God, but that, that should cause us to look forward with joy to the day when evil and injustice will be gone forever. So David wrote this. It's for the choir director, a psalm of King David, to be sung to the tune, Lilies. Hmm, I'd like to have heard that song. Save me, O God, for the flood waters are up to my neck. Deeper and deeper I sink into the mire. I can't find a foothold. I am in deep water, and the floods overwhelm me. I am exhausted from crying for help. My throat is parched. 
My eyes are swollen with weeping, waiting for my God to help me. Those who hate me without cause outnumber the hairs on my head. Many enemies try to destroy me with lies, demanding that I give back what I didn't steal. O oh God, you know how foolish I am. My sins cannot be hidden from you. Don't let those who trust in you be ashamed because of me. O oh, sovereign Lord of heaven's armies, don't let me cause them to be humiliated, O oh God of Israel. For I endure insults for your sake. Humiliation is written all over my face. Even my own brothers pretend they don't know me. They treat me like a stranger. Passion for your house has consumed me, and the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. Wow. When I weep and fast, they scoff at me. When I dress in burlap to show sorrow, they make fun of me. When I I am the favorite, sorry, I am the favorite topic of town gossip, and all the drunks sing about me. Wow. Wow. Imagine David being beat up like this, just the way his reputation is trashed. But here you go, another psalm moment yet, and yet I'll praise you. And David says, but I keep praying to you, Lord, hoping this time you will show me favor. In your unfailing love, O God, answer my prayer with your sure salvation. Rescue me from the mud. Don't let me sink any deeper. Save me from those who hate me and pull me from these deep waters. Don't let the floods overwhelm me or the deep waters swallow me or the pit of death devour me. Answer my prayers, O Lord, for your unfailing love is wonderful. Take care of me, for your mercy is so plentiful. Don't hide from your servant. Answer me quickly, for I am in deep trouble. Come and redeem me free from my enemies. And we're going to pause there as they ask us to. That's up to verse 18, and we'll finish that psalm tomorrow. Okay. Yep. Today's proverb. Sorry, I'm just double-checking the listing there. Today's proverb is Proverb 12. Verse 1. Oh, yeah, we're in Proverbs 12. <laughs> Here you go. To learn, you must love discipline. It is stupid to hate correction. Now, that's pretty straightforward. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to meditate on that. To learn, you got to love discipline. you got to love learning. And we spend our lives. In fact, I believe as we even go into the heavens to be with our, when we transition from this space to our eternal place with the Lord, we will continue have a, having a revelation of the things of God. Uh, we're not just going to sit on a cloud. I believe have, the heavenlies will be a place where we continue our spiritual journey in the Lord. So Proverbs 12, verse 1, keep stay hungry for knowledge, discipline. Let discipline teach us. And it is foolish or stupid, as it says here, to hate correction. So look for correction in a positive way, yes. But when you're corrected, don't despise it. Be encouraged, okay? All right, we're moving on. March 27th, Luke. We're going to move on. Luke 7, verse 36 to the beginning of chapter 8. Luke 7, 36. Here we go. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him. So Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. When a certain immoral woman from that city heard he was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. Then she knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet, and she wiped them off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She's a sinner. Then Jesus answered his thoughts. Hmm. He didn't say it out loud. Jesus can read people's thoughts. In the spirit, there's a way, you know, he knew what we think. God always knows what we're thinking. Anyway, he answered his thoughts. Simon, he said to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. Go ahead, teacher. So Simon doesn't realize his mind was just read. Simon replied this. Go ahead, teacher. Then Jesus told him the story. A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 pieces to the other. But neither of them could repay him, so he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? Simon answered, I suppose the one 
for whom he canceled the larger debt. That's right, Jesus said. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet, but she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but from the time I first came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. Whoa! Wow! So Jesus knew something about this woman's story. Obviously, the Pharisee didn't know. Now, we don't get the whole you know, backstory, but we know that she must have been following Jesus and recently came to follow him as a believer, came to faith to know who he was and knew that she was forgiven and feels the weight lifted from her life. What an amazing thing. And Jesus says, I tell you her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. Ooh. Then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. The men at the table said among themselves, who is this man that he goes around forgiving sins? Don't forget that that's blasphemy. In that culture, only God can forgive sins. And really, that's true. We can forgive each other for faults. Yeah, I mean, it's, it says we should stay in forgive. you know, don't bear any burden of angst or contempt or unforgiveness in our hearts. But eternal forgiveness, that's God's job, right? And Jesus is proclaiming that. So they know, the Pharisees know, like, no, 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 that's blasphemy. They're freaking out. And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Wow, folks, there it is again. Your faith has saved you. Faith in Christ. Your faith has saved you. We are saved by faith, right? Well, saved by grace. Grace, the unmerited favor of God, the the freedom in God, his blood that covers us. But your faith has saved you. Now, this is an interesting statement because Jesus hasn't died yet but almost in proxy or in speaking into what's coming, his salvation, you know, Jesus bringing salvation to the earth. This woman has received it, her faith, knowing in who he is and recognizing it, that's her salvation. Just as a reminder, people say, well, isn't that kind of getting saved by works? No, folks, coming to faith is not a works. It's not a work. It's acknowledging your need for the Lord. That does not work. And that's always, that sometimes people want to twist that a bit in some circles. Don't let them do that. No. Coming to faith in Christ is repentance. That's like, oh, that's my Savior. I can't save myself. I can't do enough good works. I can't offer enough Old Testament stuff. I can't follow enough law to get saved. No. So I just had to affirm that very important statement here in this uh, last line of Luke chapter 7. Jesus says to her, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Thank you, Lord. Chapter 8, we're going to just do a few verses. So soon afterward, Jesus began a tour of the nearby towns and villages, preaching and announcing the good news about the kingdom of God. He took his 12 disciples with him, along with some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Among them were Mary Magdalene from whom he'd cast out seven demons. How about that? Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's business manager. So she's a politician's wife, right? Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's business manager. And Susanna, and many others who were contributing from their own resources to support Jesus and his disciples. Uh, That would be an interesting study right there, you know. Uh, So Jesus did have financial support, and it was common for rabbis or popular teachers to receive support from the communities and have followers. So folks don't choke on that. Just Jesus had financial support, and they could take care of their taxes. They could take care of their business. They gave to people and so on. And Jesus and the disciples traveling would have had to have had support in some fashion. We rarely think about that, but there it is. All right, that's the daily Bible reading. We'll pick it up again tomorrow. Bless you all. Stay encouraged in these days. All right.
Take care. Bye-bye.